In the 1990s, a close-knit immigrant community was terrorized by one of its own. Those who turned to the police for help found themselves threatened or killed. Despite the risk, two men refused to back down. Their testimony could help end the killing if the FBI got close enough to uncover one man's deadly business. Many immigrants escaped the poverty of India to start new lives in the United States. Most dream of a better life for their families. One twisted the American dream into a nightmare. When people started turning up dead in New York's Indian community, law enforcement struggled to link fraud and murder to one powerful man. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. When the promise of the American dream was shattered by murder and corruption, the FBI provided hope to those people who had seen their lives and families torn apart. July 9th, 1995. Gas station attendant Kulwant Singh commuted to a gas station in the Bronx to work the late shift. Less than a year earlier, he had arrived in New York from a poor town in India, hoping to make a better life for himself and his family. That night, he disappeared. In October, the missing man's brother, Manmohan Singh, traveled to the U.S. to find him. He hadn't heard from his brother in months. It wasn't like him not to write or call. He began his search in Queens at the address of one of his brother's friends. His name was Satinderjit Singh. His family was from the same village as the missing attendants. Although this friend had the same last name, he was not related. Like many members of the Sikh religion, Satinderjit took the surname Singh, which means liar in the Punjabi language. Satinderjit said a missing persons report had been filed, but police had found no trace of his friend. He advised the new arrival to be careful who he talked to. Searching for the brother would be dangerous. Manmohan visited the gas station in the Bronx where his brother had worked. He spoke to an attendant, but the man was afraid to respond. His supervisor made it clear that no one should be asking questions. The employee was instructed to keep quiet. But Manmohan was persistent and convinced the attendant to meet him at a diner a few Look, days later. I can only be here for a few minutes. I know you're looking for him. And... The attendant said the missing brother had been accused of stealing from the gas station. And he was coming in to... Whether or not the allegations were true, they had made the station's owner angry. The attendant believed Manmohan's brother had been kidnapped and probably killed. By March of 1997, 
a year and a half after his brother's abduction, Manmohan took a job at a gas station in New York. He worked nights so he could spend his days secretly gathering information. He believed he knew who was responsible and was ready to go to the police. Okay, I need some oil. Then, on the night of March 16, 1997, he was silenced. Brooklyn North homicide detectives received a call from a customer who found the body. They photographed the crime scene to record its condition, then gathered evidence. They collected two shell casings from a 9mm Ruger. Detectives found the register had been robbed, but were surprised that the thief had left some cash behind. Police also found no fingerprints. Detective Tony Brazada concluded that robbery was not the prime motive. We examined the scene, and it looked like it was a typical gas station robbery at the beginning, but then examining the scene thoroughly, it seemed that it was more like an assassination or a this person was a target because he was shot very close range behind the head and he was on his knees. Detectives visited the Sikh temple where the funeral was being held. They knew this immigrant community was wary of outsiders but hoped to find friends of the victim willing to talk. Satinjajit Singh stepped forward. He told detectives that he knew the slain man. Detectives explained that without cooperation, the killer would likely go free. Although he knew he was jeopardizing his own safety, he promised to meet with detectives and help them in any way he could. The following day, Satinjajit Singh came to the police station as promised. Yes, sir. He brought with him another witness, Savjit, who was also willing to talk. They told detectives they believed a wealthy and powerful Indian man named Dinza had ordered the murder of their friend, as well as the abduction of their friend's brother. Dinza was a corrupt and ruthless businessman who was well known in the Sikh community. Like many others, he had come to the U.S. from India in the mid-1980s with only a few dollars in his pocket. But his story was different than most. He had amassed an empire of more than 50 gas stations in and around New York City. And, uh, which was common with all the... The witnesses knew several of Dinza's employees and explained to Detective Teddy Braun that the millionaire would stop at nothing to protect his business. His whole thing was fear. He used the fear tactic that he had this community petrified him. I mean, to the point where he could walk in and do something in front of hundreds of people and no one's gonna say nothing. Police also learned that Dinza was no stranger to crime. His record included convictions for felony assault, kidnapping, robbery, gas pump fraud, and weapons possession. He'd served time, but always managed to get back on the street to run his mafia-style operation. Within the Sikh community, Dinza was known as the Indian Godfather. The witnesses said Dinza's empire was a family affair, with Dinza's brother a member of the inner circle and an enforcer for the organization. And then Sarvjit had seen for himself just how ruthless the brother could be. In 1993, outside a Queen's restaurant, the informant witnessed Dinza's brother arguing with a man. The disagreement ended with Dinza's brother shooting him in close range. Sarvjit rushed to the victim's side, but it was too late. Dinza's brother was spirited out of the country to India. He was never captured.
The witnesses now told the detectives that they'd heard the brother would soon be returning to America. They were risking their lives talking to police, but they couldn't let the violence continue. Yes, sir. Both promised to report when Dinza's brother arrived. He's going to be coming back to the United States because Dinza's company was getting so big that Dinza needed another hand. And Dinza was the type of person where he'd rather have family hands-on than outsiders when it came to his money. True to their word, in May of 1997, the witnesses told police that Dinza's brother was back in New York. Police set up outside the warehouse of Dinza's headquarters in Brooklyn, waiting for his brother to arrive. In front, it's clear. Both witnesses were present to assist police with identifying the murder suspect. We have a possible target. Stand by. Armed with an arrest warrant, police surrounded the building and cordoned off all entrances, including the back doors of the warehouse. From the surveillance van, Satinderjit confirmed that it was Dinza's brother heading for the front door. We have a target entering the building. Moments later, officers reported that shots were fired inside the building. They held their posts, waiting for orders. Ready? We're going in. Let's go. Officers forcibly entered the front of the building. Three men raced out the back door into the hands of police. The men were Dinza's brother, his cousin, and his nephew. All three were arrested. Quickly securing a search warrant, police confiscated firearms. Seven pistols, a shotgun, and a silenced machine gun. As they loaded the contraband into a police car, Dinza himself arrived at the scene. He protested the seizure, claiming that the building and guns were his property. But the guns were illegal. Police arrested him on weapons possession charges. They took him to the 112th precinct, where Dinza was booked and fingerprinted. Police pressured him to cooperate. They had two witnesses who would testify against him and his brother for murder. Insisting he was innocent, he refused to talk. Dinza was held in the Brooklyn Correctional Facility awaiting a bail hearing. But incarceration did not prevent the murder suspect from running his empire. Speaking in Punjabi so guards couldn't understand him, he coerced employees and acquaintances to find out who dared to testify against him and his brother. Besides witness statements, police had little other evidence. Dinza would be out on bail shortly. If he discovered the identity of the witnesses, they might not testify. Then, the murder and weapons charges against the brothers would have to be dropped. In May 1997, New York City police arrested two East Indian brothers who had been terrorizing their immigrant community for years. Except for the statements of two witnesses, investigators had little evidence against them. But they believed that Dinza was the ringleader and that he had ordered two murders and a kidnapping. Dinza had posted bail on May 4, 1997, just days after his arrest. But his brother remained held on a murder charge in New York City's Rikers Island prison. Through informants, Dinza had learned the identity of the two witnesses against him. 
if they continued to cooperate with the police. He, his brother, and his multi-million dollar gas station empire would be in jeopardy. Okay, come in a little more. One of the witnesses, so Satinderjit Singh, was close with several employees of the suspected murderer. He knew a great deal about how Dinza ran his $60 million gas station chain. He said that Dinza rigged pumps, skimmed profits, and ordered people abducted if they talked. Detectives believe the information was compelling enough to seek an indictment. In early June of 1997, investigators met with the assistant U.S. attorney to explore Dinza's illegal activities. NYPD detective Teddy Braun explained how Dinza's pump rigging scheme worked. Dinza owned like 53 gas stations, and uh, he had this unique skimming system. And what it did was it regulated the amount of gas that was pumped into a consumer's vehicle. So. If you would have went in an extra $10 worth of gas, he'd be able to set up that machine where it can give you 80%, 90%, whatever percent that he wanted to give you, and the rest would be saved. Assistant U.S. Attorney Ben Campbell learned that not only was Dinza's empire corrupt, it was extensive. The NYPD informed us that Dinza um, had, among other things, an organization built around um, uh, pump fraud, basically ripping off customers at his gasoline stations throughout the New York and New Jersey area, by which he generated millions of dollars in income, that he protected that pump fraud activity through a pattern of violent uh, crime, including murder. On June 18th, just as the federal investigation was beginning, witness Satinderjit Singh was shot to death in Queens. It was the day before Dinza's brother, suspected of murder, was scheduled to attend a hearing. At the crime scene, a neighbor told police he had witnessed the crime. He had been outside at the top of his stoop when the shooting took place. Since his apartment lacked air conditioning, he was watching a Mets game on his front porch. He was distracted by what appeared to be a traffic dispute. The neighbor described the shooter as a tall African-American male, but he never saw his face. The slain man's cousin was sitting beside his relative in the car who was killed. The cousin told police it had all happened so fast. He was too shaken to remember any details. Forensic technicians photographed the scene. They collected shells that had been fired from a 9mm handgun. No other physical evidence was found. Nothing to prove that Dinza was responsible. Investigators believe that Dinza would continue to use any means necessary to protect his millions. They needed some way to stop him. NYPD detectives turned to Assistant U.S. Attorney Ben Campbell for guidance he would refocus the investigation to take advantage of the federal RICO statute, the Racketeering Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act, a law used to prosecute organized crime. This looked like had all the hallmarks of a racketeering prosecution. It had um, an organization with uh, leadership, it had racketeering activity which generated income, and it had a pattern of criminal activity which spanned several years, almost a decade. This would widen the scope of the investigation considerably. The assistant U.S. attorney called on the FBI for help. Special agent in charge Kevin Donovan from the FBI's New York field office worked the case. The FBI was planning on conducting a traditional organized crime investigation that would focus on 
uh, development of cooperating witnesses, use of cooperating witnesses, review of records, and search warrants to focus on the multiple acts of violence and the multiple acts of fraud. That would not be easy. In order to develop new witnesses, agents would have to ensure the safety of those who came forward. As long as Dinza Singh was able to intimidate witnesses through violence, threats of violence and homicides, our investigation would be very limited. We needed to make sure that no other individuals who would cooperate with us would be hurt by Dinza Singh. News of the most recent killing spread quickly through the Sikh community. The other witness, Sarvjit, and his family prepared to leave town. Investigators pleaded with him to allow the FBI to place him under protective custody. But he insisted on taking his wife and two small children away from New York. Despite investigators' best efforts, Dinza had intimidated another witness. To the Sikh community, the police and the FBI seemed powerless to protect them. In the summer of 1997, the FBI was on the trail of a violent businessman named Dinza. Investigators believed he had already killed two men, kidnapped a third, and scared another out of New York. They needed an informant close to Dinza to get enough evidence to arrest him. I will get back to you. But special agent in charge Kevin Donovan found that Dinza was well protected. The major hurdle that the FBI and the New York City Police Department had to overcome was an inability to develop cooperating witnesses and informants early on due to language difficulties and due to the fact that most of the individuals who worked at City Gas Corporation were not willing to come forward because of Dinza Singh's threats of violence and his acts of violence that were well known throughout the community. Dinza now threatened the life of another member of the Sikh community. Balwant Singh was close friends with the witness who had fled the city with his family. The man was terrified. Dinza had come after him to find the one remaining witness. He remained holed up in his apartment with his wife and daughter for three days before he finally called police. He reached the Queen's Homicide Unit, which was investigating the murder of Satinderjit Singh, a witness against Dinza. Bolwan told police that he had attended the slain man's funeral. There he was approached by one of Dinza's men. He asked Bolwan where the other witness was hiding. Dinza wanted to discuss the witness's testimony face to face. Balwant refused to tell him anything. But now he feared for his own life. Police told him that they would discuss the possibility of providing him and his family with protective custody. Two detectives would be right over. Since the funeral, he had been ignoring the demands of the construction company he owned. Mr. Singh, please. Hello? Yes, Mr. Singh. Yes. Here at the office when the company called, he agreed to run an urgent errand. He left his frightened family, promising he'd return as soon as he could. He knew Dinza's reputation. It would be difficult to avoid him for very long. Just minutes after pulling out, the man noticed a sedan that seemed to be following him.
it was Denzel. Balwan didn't want to take any chances, so he returned home. Dinza sped away. As detectives headed for Balwan's apartment, they received a page. It was a coded message from their supervisor, asking them to call in immediately. Lacking a cell phone, they stopped to make the urgent call. While the detective was on the phone, he noticed an Indian man watching him closely from a car. He decided to investigate. The detectives asked the driver for his license and registration. It was Dinza. Mind stepping at, sir? When detectives asked to search his car, he agreed. Inside, they found some gas receipts. In the trunk, detectives also found electronic gauges for gas pumps. Dinza possessed nothing that was illegal. Since there was no outstanding warrant for his arrest, detectives let him go. The detectives were called away on an emergency. They never made it to the informant's home that day. The next morning, the man's frightened wife called police. Her husband had taken refuge in a friend's gas station. He waited anxiously for them to arrive and was relieved to see them pull up. His wife and daughter were picked up moments later. That evening, the family was taken to an undisclosed hotel outside of New York. The family would hide there under police protection until Dinza could be arrested. Detectives informed Balwant that they had run into Dinza near his neighborhood. They asked if he could verify the man's identity from a photo. Balwant identified him instantly. Investigators had one more witness in their case against the deadly businessman, but they still lacked sufficient evidence to make an arrest. In July of 1997, FBI agents and NYPD detectives believed gas station mogul Dinza was the man behind the murders of two Indian immigrants and the disappearance of a third. Investigators had little evidence to prove their theory, and Dinza's intimidation had silenced most witnesses. But a few among the community were tired of living in fear. At the end of July, Brooklyn North homicide detective Teddy Braun interviewed a source close to Dinza. During the interview with the confidential informant, my partner Tony Rosada came across a name Marvin, who was linked as Dinza Singh's strong arm. The man's full name was Marvin Dodson. He was a 35-year-old African-American male. Detectives discovered that he had an arrest record for illegal firearms. Any of these men look familiar? They showed a photo lineup to the cousin men? of the slain witness who was in the car when the shooting occurred. I recognize any of these men? He immediately identified Dodson as the gunman. Detective Anthony Brazada now began searching for Marvin Dodson. My partner and myself put together a list of uh, various locations, like about six or eight locations where he hung out, uh, his residence, his relatives. 
On July 4th, 1997, police cornered Dotson in a Queens neighborhood. Cornered Dotson! Turn off your ignition! Throw your keys out of the window! Now! Do it! Go by the car, sir! They arrested him and took him to the station. Go to the door, do it! Stop! Dodson agreed to testify against Dinza in return for a lighter sentence. On Sunday morning, July 6th, 1997, Dodson and his attorney met with Queens homicide detectives, the assistant U.S. attorney, and the FBI. Dodson confessed that he had been hired by Dinza for the murder. Dodson said the plan to kill one of the witnesses began on May 18th, 1997. At the time, Dinza had just been released on bail. Dodson would be the trigger man, hired to kill the witness scheduled to testify against Dinza and his brother. First, they picked up the murder weapon, a 9mm Ruger. The same caliber of shell casings were later collected at the crime scene. Dodson told investigators that Dinza then ordered him to hire a driver for the hit. Go ahead and tell us a story. Dinza's next move was to conduct surveillance of the witnesses. Assistant U.S. Attorney Ben Campbell recalls that Dinza provided Dodson with all the information he'd need to get to Satinderjit Singh. He gave Mr. Dodson the address where Satinderjit Singh lived, the license plate number to his vehicle, and instructed um, Mr. Dodson to watch Satinderjit Singh and kill him at the first opportunity. What do you do with the gun? On June 18, 1997, Dodson received a phone yes, call from Dinza. His boss told him that the witness needed to be dead before nightfall. Dinza's brother's hearing was the following day. The hit would send a message to everyone who considered testifying. Dodson said that he and his driver, Walter Jazz Samuels, met Dinza at one of his gas stations. Dinza provided them with a white van. They watched Satinderjit's house until he came out. He was with his cousin. a disturbance so that Satinderjit would pull over and allow the van to pass. When he did, the van blocked him from moving. Dodson shot the unarmed man eight times at close range. The hitman's description of the events of that day corroborated a neighbor's statement to police. Dotson also told investigators that after the killing, he had returned the white van to Dinza's garage on Roosevelt Avenue. He gave the gun back to Dinza, who paid him and the driver $20,000 for the hit. On July 6, 1997, police approached the Brooklyn home of Walter Jazz Samuels, the man who Dotson claimed had driven the van. Samuels. They arrested him without incident. Police learned that Samuels had a record of previous arrests. With Samuels in custody, investigators turned their attention to Dinza. The U.S. Attorney's Office believed agents and detectives now had enough evidence to indict Dinza on federal racketeering charges. Special agent in charge Kevin Donovan recalls that agents dispersed across the city to find him. 
FBI agents and New York City Police Department detectives initiated surveillances at several city gas corporation gas stations in which Dinza Singh was known to frequent. At 5 p.m. on July 7, 1997, FBI agents and NYPD detectives followed Dinza to his Foster Avenue gas station. When he arrived, they arrested him for murder, kidnapping, pump fraud, and obstruction of justice in aid of a corrupt organization. The entire case hinged on the testimony of Dinza's hitman, Marvin Dodson. But because Dodson was a murderer, the U.S. attorney still needed to substantiate his story with other evidence or witness testimony. They hoped that testimony would come from Walter Jazz Samuels, the man who Dodson fingered as his accomplice in the murder of Satinjajit Singh. Samuels now told investigators he was not in the van at the time of the shooting. He claimed he was at a nearby restaurant. His story checked out. Investigators believe Samuels knew who drove Dodson on the day of the killing. But he wasn't talking, and neither was Dodson. Investigators needed something else to corroborate Dodson's story. They secured a search warrant for Dinza's Roosevelt Avenue gas station, the place where Dodson had returned the white van after the murder. You got any they searched the entire premises, here? but found little other than stolen license plates. They believed they were probably used on getaway cars during the commission of crimes. But once bags. again, they had no proof. They found nothing that could corroborate Dodson's story or connect Dinza to the murder. As the FBI and police continued to pursue evidence, Dinza was behind bars once again, pending a July 14th bail hearing. Investigators hoped Dinza's incarceration would encourage witnesses to come forward. It did not. As before, Dinza continued to rule with an iron hand. Unfortunately, as a result of Dinza Singh's ability to make telephone calls from jail, he was able to continue to run his corporation and his business and to focus on threatening additional individuals who might have come forward to cooperate with the FBI and the New York City Police Department. For the second time in three months, authorities held the suspected murderer behind bars. They hoped it would be his final arrest. But the millionaire hired a high-priced defense team and the prosecution's entire case still hinged on the testimony of a confessed killer. In July of 1997, a man named Dinza had been arrested on federal racketeering charges that included murder and kidnapping to protect his corrupt business empire. It was his second arrest in three months. As he had before, Dinza directed his business and even threatened potential witnesses from a prison telephone. But this time, investigators were listening. Assistant U.S. Attorney Ben Campbell was not going to let Dinza slip through his hands again. They had to keep him behind bars. First, um, his conversation was in Punjabi, which is a very um, unique dialect and uh, it took us some time before we could find a Punjabi translator to translate those telephone calls. Secondly, he was not um, very overt in his conversation, so he was somewhat cryptic in his um, conversation with his colleagues. The translations opened a rare view into just how tightly Dinza held the reins to his empire. Dinza attracted customers to his rigged pumps by advertising the lowest gas prices in New York but his pumps provided less than a gallon for the price. He was issuing routine instructions to the members of his office, telling them to um, change the price of gasoline at his various stations, to continue to order supplies for his company. In addition, um, he also gave them instructions about um, things to communicate to their attorneys and steps to be taken in order to try and get him out on bail. As Campbell raced to find evidence to keep Dinza from making bail, 
Police processed the suspect's car. They found business cards that linked Dinza to his hitman, Marvin Dodson, and Dodson's operative, Walter Jazz Samuels. Police also recovered a list of names and addresses that appeared to be a hit list. The list included the home address of Savjit Singh, a federal witness who had fled the city with his family. Balwant Singh, who was under protective custody, had also made the list. Seven more men with Punjabi names appeared as well. It was just what investigators needed to keep Dinza from making bail. While they did not know whether these men were dead or alive, they knew who might. Agents asked Walter Samuels about the list, hoping it would prompt his memory. He finally opened up. He said that Dinza had planned to kill those nine men. Two of them, Balwant and Sarvjit, were federal witnesses. The other seven were Balwant's family members. They were all still alive. Once again, agents would need to corroborate the story. Confined in the room next door, Marvin Dodson and his lawyer waited to be questioned. Dodson confirmed Samuel's story and added something else. He said that on July 3rd, just days before Dinza's most recent arrest, Dinza had purchased two used police cruisers as part of the assassination plan. Dodson had copies of the titles, which his lawyer now offered to the agent as proof. Mr. Dinsa's plan was for Mr. Dodson and Mr. Samuels to pose as law enforcement officers and to stop Mr. to stop Balwant Singh um, on the street along with members of his family and uh, kidnap them and bring them to Mr. Dinsa at an undisclosed location. You're going to try to cram all these people. Feeling the pressure and hoping to cut a deal, Samuels now told investigators the name of the man who drove the white van during the murder. His name was Evans Alonzo Powell. Because Powell had no arrest record, Dodson wanted to protect him. He had threatened Samuels not to give him up. On July 19, 1997, police arrested Powell on a Brooklyn street. He agreed to cooperate. Powell admitted that he had driven the van for the murder in Queens. Investigators finally had their corroborating witness. Powell also talked about another crime. Tell us more about where Dinza had ordered the murder of the Indian man who had traveled to America to search for his missing brother. Powell was present when Dodson killed the attendant at the Brooklyn gas station on the night of March 16, 1997. Detective Tony Brizada remembers Dodson's confession. He admitted uh, shooting him twice in the head, had him, kneel, had him kneeling down. And he said he got, he got paid by Singh for doing this. He, that Singh wanted this person uh, killed. He didn't give him a reason, but he just wanted him killed. Dinza had paid Dodson just $4,000 for taking the man's life. Dodson stole money to pay Powell for being the lookout. Special agent in charge, Kevin Donovan, continued to gather evidence about Dinza's pump rigging activities. The FBI and the New York City Police Department executed a search warrant at the Foster Avenue City Gas gas station. The focus of our search was to identify and obtain evidence of the pump rigging scheme. As a result of a, the excavation of the area around the pump, electronic devices were located in a box that was used to control the pump rigging scheme. Investigators determined that Dinza manipulated the flow of gasoline to customers' cars through devices controlled by remote, wired to the pumps and buried underground. The systems could be turned on or off at will. Detective Teddy Braun explains that Dinza taught many of his employees when to turn them on and off. You were taught how to work on remote. And what would happen would be if a person, look, for instance, 
if a person came in for a gallon of gas for their lawnmower, what would happen was the gas attendant would hit a, a remote in his pocket, which was just like a car alarm remote. And what that would do, it would shut off the skimming system. And the system would go right up to perfect. So that when the gas attendant pumped a, a gallon worth of gas in a, in a container, it was perfect. So there would be no question. In late July of 1997, the FBI conducted an exhaustive search of Dinza's Brooklyn Warehouse headquarters. There they found his double books. We discovered documents reflecting bribery payments to a corrupt Department of Consumer Affairs inspector. In addition, we also estimate um, the total value of Mr. Dinza's um, pump fraud activities in the neighborhood of $40 million over 10 years. By September of 1998, the body of the man abducted from a gas station in the Bronx in 1995 was still missing. But agents had a hunch. Based on New York City construction records at the time of his disappearance, agents suspected that Dinza had buried the attendant underneath one of his gas stations. It was determined that the most likely gas station that was under construction at that time was a gas station located at Farragut and Flatbush Avenue. On September 16, 1998, investigators arrived at the station with heavy equipment. They employed ground-penetrating radar to help locate the body beneath the earth. They selected two separate sites where they believed the man might be buried. The construction crew removed slabs of concrete and the FBI, the New York City Police Department, examined these two sites that were located by the ground penetrating radar. Investigators never found the man's body. Though this news was disappointing, investigators were having better luck with other leads. Assistant U.S. Attorney Ben Campbell subpoenaed Dinza's cell phone records. They placed Dinza at the time and place of Satinderjit Singh's murder. Prosecutors were well armed when Dinza's trial began in Brooklyn Federal District Court. They hoped to convict him on 29 counts, including capital murder. Savjit Singh, who assisted the investigation despite death threats, testified against the man accused of killing his friends. On March 2nd, 1999, after two and a half days of deliberations, the jury found Dinza guilty of 21 of the 29 counts. They included murder, attempted murder, and fraud. Dinza was acquitted in the kidnapping of the man whose body was never found. On October 5th, 1999, Dinza received eight life sentences without possibility of parole. He escaped the death penalty. Later that month, the same judge sentenced Dinza's hitmen for their roles in the murders. For assisting in the conviction of Dinza, their sentences were considerably lighter. Powell received 10 years, Samuels 12, and Dodson 18. But it was the conviction of Dinza that was most satisfying to prosecutors. Prosecution of Mr. Dinza was a very, sort of personally for me, a very rewarding experience. We were able to step into a community that frequently does not turn to law enforcement for assistance and to render some significant help to them in order to remove an individual who was, um, I mean, for lack of a better term, um, a plague on that community. Like many immigrants before him, Dinza arrived a poor man and was embraced by a community of compatriots. But he repaid their kindness with swindles and murder. For his greed and brutality, he will never be free again.